First Unitarian. One of the more famous poems from the 13th century mystic Sufi Yahaludan Rumi goes like this. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. They may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whomever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So, in my own humble opinion, as spiritual guidance goes, that's top-notch. Rare and precious, wisdom, truthful, beautiful. And like all high-quality spiritual guidance, a whole lot easier said than done. Emotional courage is our subject this morning, and I'll share up front that of all the types of courage we've been exploring in this series, this one has been the most difficult for me to wrap my head around and to write about. And yes, uh, I'm aware that I just said I've been trying to wrap my head around emotional courage. And yes, I'm aware that is probably the essence of my problem. Because like most of you, at least I suspect this is true for you as well, I lead with my head. It's what people in our culture are trained to do, especially men, but certainly not limited to men. Intellectualize, analyze, contextualize, bury, deny, ignore, and so on, relegating our emotional lives to the background. Unimportant at best, untrustworthy, and misleading at worst. Which is maybe, you know, economically rewarding in this world, but spiritually impoverishing. That's what all the wisdom literature is pretty darn clear about. And it's a shame. Because emotional courage might be, this is what I read, the most essential, most necessary courage of them all for having a self-aware, balanced life of intimate connection and authentic relationship with other human beings. You've probably seen the TED Talk by Dr. Brene Brown about vulnerability and her research on human shame. If you haven't, even if you have, it's worth recapping here because it's really relevant to my subject. Dr. Brown uses the classic psychological distinction between feeling guilt and feeling shame. That is, guilt is something we feel for something we have done or not done. It's very specific to a situation. Shame, on the other hand, is something we feel because of deep-rooted beliefs about who we are or what we are. She says, shame can be understood as a fear of disconnection. Deep down, do we believe that we are good enough, that we are lovable, that we are worthy of love? Shame can be understood as a fear of disconnection. And she maintains that this experience is universal. We all have it, but no one talks about it. She says what underpins this shame, these feelings in our hearts and souls, is the ability to be vulnerable. I would say to be emotionally courageous. Isn't it something, she says, when you ask people about love, they tend to tell you about heartbreak. Isn't it something when you ask people about belonging, they will tell you their most excruciating experiences of being excluded or shunned. When you ask people about connection, the stories you get are most likely to be about disconnection. She says we tend to numb vulnerability to keep ourselves safe, keep ourselves distant, shut out or avoid the feelings and experiences 
where being vulnerable is required. Some examples of vulnerability. Asking for help when we need it. Initiating sex with a partner or a lover or a friend, husband, spouse, whatever. Asking for a job. Laying people off. Calling someone out on inappropriate or unwanted behavior. Setting healthy boundaries in a relationship, deciding that you no longer need those boundaries in a relationship, moving towards or being with someone who is experiencing great grief or great pain, waiting for the doctor to call back, and so on and so on. All of these require considerable emotional courage. So readily admitting the risks of oversimplification, she believes there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who have a strong sense of love and belonging and those who struggle with having a sense of love and belonging. And the difference, she says, is between those who believe they are worthy of love and belonging and those who do not believe they are worthy of love and belonging. People who believe they are worthy are people who have the courage to be imperfect, They have genuine compassion for themselves, in addition to compassion for others. They have connection as a result of authenticity. They're willing to let go of what they thought they should be be in order to be who they really are. They share being vulnerable. They are able to see their own imperfections as beautiful, neither comfortable nor excruciating, but simply necessary, simply what is. They have a willingness to breathe through discomfort, waiting, bad news, heartbreak, even feelings of ecstasy and joy. They let these feelings in rather than pushing them away. They are willing to invest in relationships or endeavors with no guarantee of success, things that might probably not even work out. Paraphrasing Dr. Brown here, Here's the quintessentially human paradox. We know that the fear of being vulnerable is the core symptom or manifestation of shame and feelings of unworthiness. But we also know that being vulnerable is the very birthplace of joy and creativity, of belonging, of love. The problem, she goes on, is no one can numb selectively. It doesn't work that way. You can't say, I'm going to numb myself to this shame, this grief, this betrayal, this pain, this rejection, this anger, without also numbing out joy and gratitude and love and creativity and happiness. It's a whole package. Author Susan David says it plainly. Only dead people never get unwanted emotions or inconvenient feelings. Only dead people never get stressed, never get broken hearts, never experience the disappointment that comes with failure. You don't get to have a meaningful career, raise a family, be part of a diverse human community, or leave the world a better place without some stress and some discomfort. This, I love this quote, emotional discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. Hmm. It strikes me that that's true. Whether you're trying to be intimate and honest with a friend that you love, whether you're coming out to your parents and family and friends, whether you're striking out on a new career, facing the fear of being homeless or destitute, as many people are right now, trying to get immigration to reopen your case, staying in relationship with your racist relative or working to dismantle white supremacy culture in your church, emotional discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. Might be one of the ways you know you're still alive and still growing. Might be one of the ways you know you're getting your life right. It's not when everything feels good or feels right all the time, but that sometimes things get messy and uncomfortable. I'm going to close with this thought from Maurice Freehill, who wondered once, who is more foolish, the child who's afraid of the dark or the adult who's afraid of the light? 
May we all step joyfully into the light of discomfort and connection. Amen. See you soon.